Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Steve Marshall, as, uh, as, as uh, the introduction said, and uh, I come from the, the Hyperspectral Imaging Centre, and we work on uh, basically data analysis. So we are algorithms people, we're processing people. We're not from a physics or optics background. Uh, and I established the Hyperspectral Imaging Centre. And these are just some of the partner organisations that we have current projects with. All of these organisations, we have uh, some sort of interaction, either a, a research grant or, or a studentship or, or something like that. Not all of these are in the remote sensing area. Some of them are, you can probably guess, like BA Systems and TALIS. Um, also SAMS, which is the Scottish Association of Marine Science, looking at uh, ice flows. We've done work with M squared lasers. We had a, a speaker earlier. So those are some of the, the projects that we do. And we are um, quite unashamedly an industry facing group, even though that we are well, part, of a, part of a university. We're based in the Technology Innovation Center. This is the inside of the building to the left of um, that was in the last slide uh, of, of, the, uh, of the previous speaker. And uh, this is a very exciting building in which we, all of our industry facing research is in there, our research groups are there. Also the Fraunhofer Institute is in, in that institution as well. So it's meant to be a real kind of hub of, uh, internet, of, of basically innovation connected with industry. So I'll be talking today a little bit about overview of the trends and technologies in remote sensing. I must say I had to do a bit of swatting up outside of my area here, and I also contacted some colleagues to say what, what they did. So this is a bit of a kind of overview. I'll talk about some of the processing challenges and current applications, and also some of my colleagues have said, I'm not using remote sensing, but I'd quite like to use it. So in some cases, I'll be showing some slides here. It'll be interesting to see if any of that is, is valuable. So, this is, some, this is a slide that I found on a, a paper by, by Headwall looking at what are the different stages of remote sensing. So the first one was resolution. Early resolution was very coarse, was about 30 meter resolution. And it's now down to, in some cases, um, in some cases less than a meter of, of detail. Very, very high precision. Uh, the next one is the accuracy that these, the maps that we get are correct, that they match what is on the ground. Uh, in, improvements in GPS technology have made this better. And if you know what the map on the ground, you can kind of uh, adjust the data that you're getting to be able to, to fit that. Speed, so speed not only in terms of collection of the data, but distributing it. If you're a farmer and you want to know is there blight somewhere in your field? Is, is this a part of your field not getting nutrients? Then you're wanting that data really within 24 hours to be able to make, do something about it. It's no good getting it six weeks later when your, your crops are ruined. And lastly, I think the main big area in this is analytics. As we collect more and more and more data, we can't expect people to, to look at it and work through it. We need clever tools to be able to extract the information we want and present it in an efficient way, to track over time and tell us what has changed, uh, and maybe even to pull out trends that we didn't know were there. In terms of drone technology, as well as sort of satellite data, in terms of drone technology, we're getting smaller and lighter optics. We're getting better battery technology. We're getting better designs of being able to produce drones that can stay in the air for longer. And uh, light, smaller, lighter cameras, which can be fitted to them to be able to collect, collect the data. Um, so what, what we're talking about here is hyperspectral data. So we're talking about looking about the electromagnetic spectrum and seeing which spectral bands are we looking at? So the kind of bands we might be looking at, the visible band from about 400 to about 700 nanometers, uh, the infrared from about 700 to about 1100, then the, the near IR would go up from, to about 1.7, and the short wave IR to about 2, getting on to 2.5. 
all of these are reflectance data. So all of this relies on radiation from the sun hitting the earth and collecting what comes back. Then there's the mid-wave IR getting into the uh, 3,000 nanometers, the kind of thing um, that the, the speaker from M squared talked about, like hydrocarbons showing up. Some of this is solar and some of this is thermal. And then getting onto the, the higher wavelengths where it's thermal data. So it's, it's the, the heat from the earth coming up. So that doesn't rely on daylight uh, for that. This is a head wall uh, all-in-one drone with, a, with a, uh, a camera built into it, uh, which you can buy off the shelf to do your, to do your imaging. Electromagnetic spectrum, different things show up. So different types of uh, material show up at different parts in the electromagnetic spectrum. So they absorb the, the, the bonds and uh, resonate and absorb that, uh, the, the, the radiation at those bands. So there are water bands at certain points. There's chlorophyll telling us about vegetation. There's all sorts of chemicals and hydrocarbons at different places, depending on what you're, what you're interested in. And here's an example from, that was provided to me by uh, an associate at the um, University of Manchester and also uh, an Italian research institute on vulcan vulcanology. This is looking at an eruption in uh, Cape Verde uh, a, a couple of years ago. And um, this is Landsat data of a volcanic eruption. It's looking at the the bands going to the shortwave IR. And what they've done here, they've colored it in red, about 2.2 in red, 1.6 in green, and about the 6.5, they've mapped that to blue. So it's hyperspectral data, but they're turning it into an RGB, kind of artificial RGB. And they've done that in such a way that it, it kind of makes sense that the, the lava looks black, the vegeta uh, veg 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 uh, vegetated areas appear green, and the active lava is red and yellow, and the plumes of the gases are in blue. So you can see the different stages of the eruption. And what they've got here is the satellite imagery over a number of days in late 2014. And they can use the satellite data for looking at the, uh, the way in which the lava has flowed uh, and where it, where it is gone. They color this with different, uh, different tones of gray to tell it about the different types of data. And the key slide at the end is they're able to show contours of the extent of the lava flow at different points over that period. And that's, that's really, this is, the, the person who sent this to me said, this is really the, the key slide. It's that they can show to the volcanologists, this is where the lava has flowed, and also saying, does this map the theoretical models of what you thought was gonna happen in the case of an eruption? Um, other types of work, this is my colleague David McKee in physics at the University of Strathclyde. He's interested in ocean color, and what is in the oceans at any particular point in time? And by using the hyperspectral satellite data, he can look at chlorophyll, can look at uh, sediment, and different, different things swirling around here. Um, if there's extensive flooding, if there's different changes in weather patterns, it tells us what kind of minerals are in the sea at any point in time. This has all sorts of implications for wildlife uh, and, and letting us know what is, what is going on. Um, He's also developed some new models for being able to pull out this data and display it. And this is showing the, um, the, the different types of uh, mud and the behavior of, uh, behavior of the ocean. Um, of course, all of this, you have to verify it's correct. It's all very well getting these satellite pictures and saying that's happening there, that's happening there. How do we know that that's correct? And what he's done here is actually looked at um, pieces of sediment from Stonehaven. This is samples of, of real, um, 
real material which has been collected and undergone a chemical analysis in order to match that up to show that his models are indeed correct and that his predictions are correct. Because it's, it's really important this validating the data you're getting rather than interpreting it and saying, this is what we're seeing without knowing if that's necessarily correct. And this here is uh, part of the Thames estuary. This is the Essex coast and the Kent, uh, Kent coast here. And this is look at the changes due to the turbine arrays in the, in the Thames estuary. Other types of work are carried out. Um, I've, I've been involved and some of my team have been involved in looking at old historic buildings. Uh, this is uh, the cathedral in Glasgow, or one of the cathedrals in Glasgow. Um, our architecture department look at this, and they want to know what state is the building. Does it need repair? Is it going to fall down? And normally, they look at this by putting scaffolding up. And someone climbs up the scaffolding, and they look at all these windows, and they look at the timber, and check it out. Well, this can be done. So this is, this is what they normally do. They put scaffolding up collect lots of data and analyze it. They can now use drones for doing this. You can fly a drone and you can have a look around and check if it's OK. Maybe you still need to put scaffolding up, but you only put it up when you really have to. Instead of doing it everywhere, if you suspect there's a problem, you put the scaffolding up. If you can reduce your scaffolding by 80%, that's the main part of the cost. Also, better data analytics. Does someone really have to go back and draw around all these blocks? Does someone have to look at every crack and every joint of that? Or can we get better algorithms to be able to do that automatically? So we're working on a number of projects with my, my colleagues in, in architecture. This is some work carried out for environmental um, uh, monitoring in Spain. Um, these are some examples of unmanned aircraft. I've got some data on them. Uh, in, the next, in the next sheet. This is from a paper by Gonzalo et al. Um, the Atlante, Milano, al, uh, Allo and, and Siva. And so you can see here the different, um, the different drones. And this is just an overview of the, uh, the specifications of each of them. So you can see here, I notice there seems to be almost a direct correlation between the overall weight and the flight time. Uh, none of these are very fast. They're all kind of fairly moderate speeds. Um, the height also seems to be quite closely related to the, um, uh, to the, weight, of the, um, the weight of these. And these are equipped with a couple of sensors. Um, one of them is the uh, head wall hyperspec sensor. So these are push broom sensors, so they're basically line scans that you take as you're going along. Um, they compare two different types of sensors, so these are typical devices which are light enough to mount on the aircraft. Um, the weight, um, you're looking in the, in the order of kilograms, and uh, both of these are largely in the visible, a little bit into the, into the near IR. These are the number of spectral bands. You tend to only think of the pixels in one direction because that's where the, 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 the sensors are. And the pixels in the other direction are based on moving your scan. So the number of is just is to do with your frame rate and how fast it's moving. I had a look on the head wall. And this is the, it's an iTres device. I had a look on both of the websites. And these devices seem to have been superseded. So they're very, very quickly changing. But of course, once you've bought one, you're not going to change that too regularly. Here's the kind of thing they look like. This is the same sort of model. This is a typical head wall, uh, head wall device. And uh, this is the iTres device that I got from, the, uh, uh, from, their, from their website. When you collect uh, data from a long way up, then you need atmospheric correction. The raw reflectance that you get can be subject to uh, all sorts of atmospheric effects and scattering. Uh, and usually, it needs some sort of correction to be able to, to, to pull out this data. Uh, and one of the projects we have at Strathclyde, I can't say an awful lot about this, but I'll just give you an overview of it. 
Basically, when you collect data from a long way up, the reflectance is from the sun. Some of the light that you want hits the ground and bounces up, and it's basically the red is the light that you want. But you also end up with light which is scattered back, which doesn't get to the ground, but is scattered back from the atmosphere. And you also get light which takes other paths into here and can mess it up. Also, the atmosphere has different, different gases in the atmosphere have different absorption bands. So water has classical absorption bands at different wavelengths. Uh, oxygen, ozone, CO2, uh, different hydro, hydrocarbons have different absorption bands. So whatever your spectrum is, they'll have these bits chopped out of them. So it's no good just throwing this at a neural network or a support vector machine or some sort of classification because they'll all have these in and then the chances are they'll be the biggest thing. So you don't want to train it on that. So usually you have to leave these out of any sort of, any sort of classification. In, in this project, we have data taken from, it, it's from an aircraft, but very, very high up. And we also have known calibrated material on the ground. So this is material which has been calibrated in a laboratory so we know what the actual spectrum is. And we can use that to understand what the, if you like, the transform is of the atmosphere, how it's been messed up by that. And we can also, we should, there are, there are models, um, Modtran and various commercial models for modeling the atmosphere. You put in the time of day, you put in the time of year, it should help you to correct it. And we can, we can actually test how well that works. And we can also look at carrying out target recognition and classification with and without atmospheric correction. And this here, the top one, is the raw uh, reflectance data that we got. And the bottom one is data that we've corrected for, um, for the atmospheric correction. And you'll see there are various, um, various features and detail which becomes apparent when you carry out that correction. Um, lots of other projects. There's actually uh, a couple of projects I forgot to mention. One is um, I have a, a project looking at, um, which I've just got recently, looking at oil under ice in the Arctic regions. So using active hyperspectral data to see if we can see where oil is under ice. If there's an oil spill, it's good if you know where the oil's going because then you can see the place it'll emerge and put mitigation in at that point. Other projects on looking at um, remote sensing data for ice flows. How are icebergs flowing? How are they breaking up? Is this changing over time? Is there a, a climate change effect? Is it seasonal? A couple of work by companies quite close to here, companies in Scotland providing services. So this isn't research, these are real services available now. One great company, Soil Essentials, must be a, a leader in agri-tech. They um, can provide all sorts of data for farmers, looking at things like uh, yield mapping, looking at the nutrients, looking at disease, so that farmers can get this information and they can say, right, where is the nitrogen? Do I need to apply more fertilizer? Is there some disease breaking out? All sorts of things which allow them to respond, either to recover crop or to maybe limit a, a disease or a blight. Um, they have all sorts of uh, GPS enabled devices. You can put it on a drone. You can get information from satellite. You can put it on a tractor as you drive it around. It'll GPS map it. It'll send that off to a processor and you can get back this, uh, this data uh, within a very short period of time. So they sell all of this stuff. Uh, another company near here, Cyberhawk, uh, work in uh, asset management. One thing um, my, my, my colleagues in the department work closely with them is um, the electrical, we have a big energy group at Strathclyde, the electrical infrastructure. How often do you inspect power, power lines? Do you inspect them all the time? It's very costly. There's probably nothing wrong with them. 
Do you leave it until a thing falls down? There's no natural lifetime. If it's near the sea, if it's near a chemical plant, if, if the wind blows in a different direction, it'll corrode at a different rate. And Cyberhawk have a whole series of programs of using drones to fly around these, to look at all the joints and look at the different points and upload the state of that asset and the different parts of that asset uh, to a big database uh, looking at uh, on a scale of how corroded, how damaged it is, and then the people who manage that asset can decide how they, how they respond to that. Um, new work with colleagues. Um, this is my colleague uh, Xu Yan at Strathclyde. He's looking at the integration of data. When you're looking at agritech data, you might have some data from the satellite, some from a drone, some from a rover. What happens if they're telling you different things? I mean, in theory, it's the same bit of the ground you're looking at. And he's looking at ways of integrating that data, making sure it's consistent, and uh, seeing what more we need to, to learn about that. Uh, another colleague, um, Professor Zoe Shipton, is a world expert in uh, um, geological work particularly gases and geological uh, gases underground, looking at uh, different types of fault lines. Uh, drilling in Utah punctured um, uh, a CO2, um, a kind of CO2 underground that had been undisturbed for 400,000 years. Um, is this something which can be done from satellites? Is this something that can be done from drones? We know that you can detect gases. Um, it, it really depends on the levels of detection, the floor of detection. But Zoe would like to kind of bring this technology to, so she's an expert in, in her particular field of the, um, the, the, the geological work. Can this expertise in remote sensing uh, bring something new to it and help her to, to do her job and her research? better than that. Um, the things I've, I've from, there's also my own knowledge, I've tapped into some work here. These are some of the papers I looked at. I don't know if any of you have looked at the paper by Gonzalez. There was a mistake in it when I was looking at that the other day and making up these slides, and I, I checked with him and he, uh, he corrected it. He said, he said the, high, uh, the head wall sensor went up to 12,000 nanometers, which would have been Fantastic if uh, they could have made that, but I, I checked with them, it was, it was just 1,200. Um, and some of these other uh, white paper that came from uh, uh, Digital Globe. So acknowledging my, my colleagues, uh, Stefania Amici from Manchester and other colleagues from Strathclyde, all of whom are either using remote sensing or would like to use remote sensing. I also looked at remote sensing applications and there's a website with a hundred interesting remote sensing applications so what i did i recorded that going by and i thought i'll let that go by while i'm taking any questions that you might have uh, at the end of the talk so there's all sorts of things here from insurance claims to people claiming fraudulently claiming eu subsidies to weather forecasting Detecting land cover, mapping soils. Um, I thought I meant to stop it at different points. So if you wanted to have a look at that, I'm sure you can Google it. I can give you the, um, give you the, the link for uh, 100 different ways in which remote sensing can be used. And there's probably hundreds more that we, that we don't know about. So, okay, that's the end of my talk. Are there any uh, questions? Thank you.